Hello and welcome to uh, a fuller understanding on the uh, Auto Limits uh, podcast, where we are exploring the works of Sam Fuller in order to gain that aforementioned fuller understanding. Uh, I am your uh, host, Craig Ennis, and with me as ever is my co-host, Robert. Hello, Robert. <laughs> Hello, Craig. How are you today? Um, not not very awake, as you can tell. I'm just trying to amuse myself conscious at the moment. Um Wonderful. Well, I'm happy to do the heavy lifting on this one because I uncharacteristically really um, connected with this particular Fuller film. Usually I'm sort of, I'm, I'm a bit uh, mealy mouthed about them. I'm kind of a bit like, oh, I really like the beginning, but then it was shit and whatever. This this one, I was thoroughly engaged by it. I wasn't looking at my phone at any point. <laughs> I was very interested in it and I, I watched it very intently and I have a lot of notes. So uh, I... <laughs> I'm happy. Yeah, to my my it. my experience was slightly different as my as my son was gearing up to uh what uh, to play a Fortnite live event and decided that he was going to be very loud, very excited and kind of more powerful than my noise cancelling headphones. So um I was slightly distracted through this one for full disclosure. But so I'm glad I'm glad it connected with you otherwise it would be a, a, a even uh more inane podcasts than usual so if you want to <laughs> yeah if you want to start uh by so um, I've, I've actually got a little bit of only only through very light research of you know imdb wikipedia type stuff but i can give a little bit of context for the film actually as well and hopefully have you have you got any stuff from his book yeah and, so, i mean you know, this was, right. yeah so obviously it's based on a um um it's based on a, a true chapter of the burma campaign that it kind of in the early uh in, in, in the early 60s, it had uh, a lot of exposure thanks to a, a book um, written by, I did write this down, <laughs> uh, a book written by uh, uh, Charlton uh, Ogburn Jr., which is a great name, Charlton yeah, Ogburn Jr. Name. He's he's um, probably a kind of a, a rich businessman in a, in a, in a Coen Brothers film, I think. <laughs> um so yeah this this book had done really quite well and there was um of course some interest people, in it. yeah there was of course some interest you know um uh and it was picked up um it was picked up by um uh this is fellow called Bill. milton sterling right who's milton involved sterling, so, yeah. what i understand about it i'll let you know what i understand about it maybe you can fill in the blanks so yeah, Basically, and it's interesting. Like I don't know if you saw, but Milton Sperling used to work as secretary for Daryl F. Zanuck, which is right, interesting right. because obviously there's that long-standing relationship between Zanuck and Fuller. So it suggests to me maybe these are kind of people who are connected anywhere, maybe knew each other. Um, you maybe you can I don't know, confirm that or something from your reading. But what was um, so basically my understanding of this is that uh, it's it's un unlike a lot of the other like a lot of the other Fuller films we've watched they've he's given himself that classic like um written produced directed and you know by samuel fuller this is not a big samuel fuller production this this comes up produced by milton sperling it comes up co-written with milton sperling so right away from the start it's like this is not a proper like full-throated fuller film and what i understand is what happened with the production of this and you might have some more detail around the edges of it is that um, Fuller was approached by Milton Sperling as, to direct this thing. Um, that Fuller said no because he really wanted to make Big Red One, and that he was told by Warner Brothers that he should direct it because if he did, then they would view it as a as a dry right. run of the Big Red yeah. One, and that they would use the success and merits of that as a way to justify this other bigger film he really wanted to make. So yeah. um, it's also something, and I'll get into this as we go. Um, this is probably partly because it's this other producer and it's his baby as well that this is the case. But we've talked about in previous uh, episodes how he's made his film in like, you know, 10 days or whatever. Or this one took him half a week to do, you know. This this film took, they filmed it on location in the Philippines. And this film took more than a month. It was like 40, it was supposed to shoot over 41 days, ended up running six oh, days a day. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah. So it was shot over a much longer period than most Fuller films. It also has a much higher budget than most Fuller films. And I think partly because of the, maybe the producer and, and what was required for this film. But I also wonder if a lot of that extra time and care, because it does feel a lot more, for want of a better word, slick 
than a lot of other Fuller films. Polished, isn't and it? I want, it's much more polished. And I wonder if some of that is because he's making it with the view that it is a dry run to his dream project. And then yeah, it's I like, so. there's a lot of care, I think, taken over it. It definitely seems like um, it, it's, it's you know, it's getting on towards being a, a bit of a prestige film, or at least the sort of film that um, you can imagine this being you can imagine this being in sort of an awards mix sort of level of, you know, it's a well-known story based on a hot property kind of serious minded war film. You, you could see it sort of sitting in that kind of um, yeah. Hacksaw Ridge territory where it's in the, it's in the mix, but it's never going to win. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And <laughs> it's a suit filler. <laughs> an <laughs> award suit filler. Does he mention this in his book? Does he mention this film and the circumstances around making it, yeah. Milton Sperling or any of that? Yeah, he, I mean, again, yeah, it, it, it got to a point in his in his biography where he's starting to sort of slow down on the amount of information. Again, this is you know, it's around about the time of his mother's death and his um, and his divorce. And he's actually come, he comes back to his mother's death at the end of this, but it, it, it is very kind of broad strokes. Um, he talks about it being a dry run. He talks about this being. We've got you know, there's some there's some typical stuff we get about interference and changing endings and that kind of thing but he talks about he talks about having um being able to do this much more stylistically akin to what he wanted the big red one to be and that being the selling point for him he wasn't overly interested in this particular story he didn't feel that because this wasn't his theater of war he didn't feel like he was particularly best paced place to um tell this story because he was mm. He was your, you know, um, this wasn't something that he had first hand experience of, but it was kind of talked in. Look, you want to make this big red one, it may be a different place, but you, you know, you know what, what war is, you know what it likes mm. to be trudging on those front lines. It was, you know, it's a story about, um, infantrymen, um, at the, at, at the tip of the spear, which is was entirely his war experience being on, on right at the front, um, in the vanguard. So yeah, it, it's although again it, it's it's reskinned if you like in different kind of clothing, but it is it is the same experience of 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 that you know experience of of combat that he does connect with, and he seems to sort of the way he writes about it in his biography, it's almost as if I don't know it, it is big red ones in the back of his mind, but it's like a there is this understanding that he does know what he's doing, which is quite strange, really, when you think that he's kind of slightly reluctant, um, that you get something that feels so much more authentic than the other stuff that he yeah. throws himself in. Do, do you know what I mean? 100%. 100%. This, this feels to me like um, it's interesting to hear that he didn't feel like he was necessarily the right person for the job because of the theatre of war and everything. Because... We've talked a lot on previous episodes with his war films about how about his talking about how war is usually it's walking places, it's waiting around, it's the moments between combat. There's not a lot of combat. There's a lot of I don't know people being sick, people being tired, people carrying things and walking, and men talking to each other and eating and whatever. And um, that's a feature of his other films. It's a feature of Steel Helmet. It's a feature of House of Bamboo. It's a feature mm. of those movies. But this one really explores that best of all of them, I think, because this one, you really get a sense of the fatigue of everything that's happening, I think. I think you get a really great sense of just how hard... So I'll go and I'll explain to the listener who maybe hasn't seen the film what's going on. But basically, you just get this... The film is essentially people on a very, very long trek and a very, very long trek that we're already assured before it begins. The guys are way too tired and over, you know, out overworked to do, which well, we, we joined weird. it three months in or something. As yeah, well, exactly. We? So, so basically, the situation is it starts, it's weird because most Fuller films start really well and then maybe teeter off. This one starts on shaky ground where you have like. Um, this the credits take place over kind of just a location shot of like some mountains, and then you get like a weird picture in picture newsreel that happens over the top of the mountains, and it's just a big info dump about like the history of the Burma campaign and how the British and the Americans were driven out of Burma and why Burma is important as a kind of a gateway to India, and then why they need to come in and retake Burma again, and it's just all newsreels giving you context. It's kind of like the opening crawl of Star Wars, but like just actual historical news facts 
Uh, and then you... Um... I, think, I do find quite interesting, because, yeah. again, it's a common theme, isn't it? Some sort of um, journalistic information dump. Uh, even that, yeah. when it starts off with those kind of newsreel animations, it seemed like that even that that, that had a much more a much better production design than the uh, kind of the, the spinning newspaper headline style things that we've had in the past. <laughs> you know what yeah. I mean? Just, um, I don't, maybe it was just because it was a nice little bit of animation, and I was like, "Oh, that's pretty." But I think he's just pulled that from newsreels. I don't think any of that's for the film. Uh, I, and it's even yeah. even so, it it still yeah. looked um, it still looked um, e even that it somehow looked looked higher budget. Yeah, it 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 does. It's I think what's weird about it is the weird picture in picture thing. Like I say, that just looks very strange. Like I don't think I've ever seen a film do that before where it like almost it just kind of brings up a box within the screen where it just shows some newsreels over over a frame of a kind of uh static uh backdrop but anyway it's um so you get these newsreels you get a bit of context and then he kind of sets up that you've got this unit of guys they've been sent into burma they're part of this attempt by the americans and the british to come in and 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 take it back uh from the japanese a few years after they've been driven out um and then you you kind of see so you're meeting these guys and you start to understand that they've been there like i say for like you said for three months already um the common question among the men is when are we going home when are we going home because they've obviously been told this is the last bit on their tour it's also told to us that the three thousand men who came as part of this group uh they under the command of this general merrill hence merrill's marauders um, the men who are involved in this, uh, we're told they were volunteers for this mission as well, and that they'd already served an amount of time and then volunteered to do this one extra bit. And then, so you get this horrible thing where, you know, they're doing this one extra bit that they volunteered for and they think they're about to go home. And then you get the general being told by the higher ups, no, you've got to make them do this other thing and it's going to take another few months. They're going to have to do this ridiculous trek. Um, and then him having to argue against that, but then ultimately having to just relay that information to his guys, who then have to relay that to their guys, and this kind of chain of command, burden of command stuff. Like in American, it's a nice, it's a nice thing, isn't it? Because there's like we're, we're with a quite a small, we're with a small platoon most mm. of the time, or two small platoons. Um, but they, you get because there's there's three, like you told three thousand people, presumably in different small platoons, mm. dotted all over the kind of. Um, these kind of rural areas sort of tr trying to keep in contact radio contact but not always kind of like there's some great bits where they're going you you're not ready why aren't you ready you you're ready you know we got yeah. ready we got trying to coordinate across this kind of terrain um and there's this real sense of them kind of not really knowing what everybody else is doing or not kind of the, there's a fatigue to the communication amongst them as well. Like it's all these people are kind of barely yeah. being held together um, in in their own platoon. But also, the platoons across in, in their shared mission is barely being held together as well. You've got this kind of prototype Kirk Bones relationship between General Merrill and the Doctor as well, yeah. where there's a kind of antagonistic friendship between the two of them, and where the Doctor's repeatedly telling him, "This isn't possible, Jim." You know, we can't do this. Uh, and he's, you know, the doctor is telling him he's going to have a heart attack if he carries on like this. He's telling him the men will have typhus and they, it's not going to be possible for them to go through it. There's a really great line later in the film where this guy says something, I'm paraphrasing, but he says something to, to, to General Merrill like, um, after this is all done, I'm going to go and have six kids. I'm going to line them all up against the wall and I'm going to tell them about all the hell we went through here in Burma. And if they don't cry, I'm going to beat them. And I was <laughs> just like, you really do get the sense of just the, the, the pure kind of hell of everything they're going through. You get men dropping down dead as they walk. You know, you get this kind of stuff. You get people going mad. Um, you, you get all this really interesting stuff going on. It's all really well portrayed the stuff you mentioned with the radio contacts really great like it's the film again i think this must come from a combination of it being based on this book but also fuller's own understanding of war and his own experience of war the the way that communication stuff happens between the units just it feels it feels so modern like it feels like like i don't know if you've watched like generation kill the, the yes. yeah. yeah 
but it could be something like Generation Kill. It's just like a guy getting on phones being like, yeah, when's your unit in? Are we going to take a few more minutes? Get in position. And then you like, where are you? Oh, we're bogged down, but we're going to be there in two minutes. Get there quicker. It's all this kind of stuff talking to all these groups. It wouldn't feel out of place that being something in Saving Private Ryan or Generation Kill. It's not something you... Yeah. It, it does quite often... It does have that... Um, it does have a sort of a touch of the... Um, of sort of like something uh, of David Simon, David Simon Black Hawk Down. There's this famous, um, famous kind of quote of David Simon's where he, they're talking about you know could the casual viewer pick this up and understand what's going on, and he says fuck the casual viewer. Like <laughs> there is kind of there is a sort of authenticity to a lot of the kind of the military procedural stuff where it is kind of not dry exactly, but it is mm. like okay, it is very procedural. Procedural, exactly, and, and um, also and that reminded me, it reminded me of something like, to a certain degree, something like a, a Black Hawk Down um, kind of approach. To things in a certain, not entirely, you know, it's not like full on, but that kind of or a or a um, what's his name, a Paul Greengrass kind of in sections where it is mm. kind of procedural. I yeah. think that I think the main thing that occurred to me from it was that it wasn't the sort of thing. I think one of the reasons it feels so modern is that procedural approach to kind of going through and showing the command structure, showing the 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 communication, showing the logistics, isn't something you'd expect from like a John Wayne or a Gary Cooper or something war movie from this era. Like and 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 it really stood out to me that kind of element of of additional kind of realism to it that it seemed to have. Um, so yeah, that, like it really stood out to me for that. I loved all that stuff. But you get these guys; they go, they're going, they they get told they have to go on this kind of massive trek. And then the majority of the movie is them going on this massive trek. People dying of disease. People dying in little skirmishes they have with Japanese forces. Uh, there's a big battle at the end, and then a very weak, abrupt ending, which I'm sure you'll come to. I'm, I'm sure that's covered uh, in when you talk about the ending being compromised. But basically, it's this it's this long old walk, and it's. Um, yeah consulting my notes for what i really want to talk about with it but i think i think one of the things that was really interesting to me like remember when we talked about seven samurai mm. i'm not putting it in the same company necessarily as seven samurai but i think one of the reasons seven samurai is so compelling as we talked about when we did a, a, a one of these about that was um everything's always very clear the geography is always clear the stakes are always clear the objective is always clear and that's one of the things that really drives this movie like you always get a sense because they'll point at a map or something. They'll be like, right, everyone's got to go here. It's this far away and you need to take this railroad. Then after you take this railroad, we're going to go down and we're going to liberate this place. Right. And you, so you're being told precisely what's going on. You always really clearly understand the stakes because you're constantly being told, fuck, all the men are even more sick now. Everyone's on the cusp of death. Everyone wants to go home. Um, when we get there, we're going to have to fight this big, fresh Japanese force that's just turned up. Uh, and it's, you know, so you always understand the stakes of what's going on. You understand the stakes for the war, like the kind of macro stakes, like in Seven Samurai, right? You understand the stakes of like what it means for the village and what it means for kind of this community. But you also understand the personal stakes. And in this, you've got like, if they don't stop this force, then the Japanese will have an invasion route to India, which is very bad, uh, which they establish. Um, but also there's the personal stakes of, you know, if they don't achieve what they're looking to achieve, these men are all going to die of disease. If they don't win, these guys aren't going to get to go home, obviously, which is something they're also desperate to do. They're, there are stakes on kind of both ends of that. The objective's very clear. Like, so I just, I, I think when films are like that, when they're that clear in the, in the, in the sense of where we're going and what the geography of it all is, because it's also very clear always kind of, you know, what they're heading towards and yeah. where they are in relation to it. And I think when films are like that, I find them much more easy to be compelled by. I always understand yeah. because then you can go into the minutiae of a scene where two guys are arguing about their rations or, or, or whatever you can go into that scene and it, it, it all, you understand where it is in the kind of macro context of everything what's going on. And you can then just kind of enjoy going in something in detail without losing sight of the overall, if that makes sense, which is something that not all, fil that sounds like really basic filmmaking, but yeah. it's not something that is in all films. It's no, not at all. Yeah. And it, like you're saying, you know, understanding the stakes at the macro to the micro as well, like it does a good job amongst the procedural sort of balancing that with the personal. There's the bit with the, um, 
sergeant lieutenant who's kind of a bit too you know it, everyone's getting close and chatting and they kind of, kind of there's this kind of warning of like you've got to you've got to maintain some distance because if this if these guys die you're the one who's got to write the letters home like mm. and there's some really you know it balances it really really nicely i think throughout yeah um, um, a lot of American war movies are a, feature things that are about the burden of command or the burden of responsibility or having these men rely on you and, you know, you having to make tough decisions. Those are recurring themes and tropes in, in, in American war movies. This one does it better than any other I've ever seen because you really feel that, that weight and those stakes for the characters involved because you get the sense from this General Merrill that the film doesn't romanticise his decision-making. The film doesn't romanticise him particularly, I didn't feel um but because there's still a potential reading there that he is pushing them too hard that he is making decisions that um maybe maybe are going to be very hard to live with to, to kind of drive these men to achieve these yeah objectives. and even as a, even but, as a general even as a general he's still kind of he's still you know there's still stuff that he's just has to relay as well yeah, like, that he's getting really up, exactly and so you kind of also get the sense of that middle manager aspect to what he's doing as well but then like um you really do feel then because you see you see the relationship between him and you're you're told basically there's this guy called Stock who's like the young character. Basically, the two main characters in the film are Merrill, played by a guy called Jeff Chandler, who is really good in this. He's got a bit of gravitas to him. He's a really cool guy. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's not, he's not your kind of standard. Um... Yeah, he's not your standard Fuller guy. And he gets uh, he he actually that actor. I don't know if you read this. Yeah. He injured his back playing baseball making this film, and then died after the film on like during back surgery, which is yeah. horrible. And then the other guy, I think Ty Harden is the name of the actor who plays this guy called Stock, who's like a commander of a platoon, and he basically looks like Casper Van Dien from Starship Troopers. <laughs> yeah, like uh... he's got real. I mean, he's you know he's he's slightly less complicated character. He's a bit more in the kind of the fuller mold, but he's got this affability to him. That yeah, quite, he does. Quite often that. Um, Quite often that they don't have. He's just kind of. Yeah. He's got this nice smile and kind of way about him, and you go, "Oh, I like him." Yeah, he's but but in a way that is 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 great for drama because when he cold cocks a guy on his outfit because he's kind of disrespected the general, it's like <laughs> this isn't in his character. Whereas any other fuller protagonist, they could cold cock anybody any day of the week, and it like usually a woman. <laughs> what they would do, usually a woman. So like the um. Yeah, so anyway, the main thing is these two characters, and, and we're told in a way that's semi homoerotic. Um, people are kind of giving them the side eye, being like, those two are very close for a general and a lieutenant or whatever it is. And then people like say to, to General Merrill during the film, like, don't worry, I've just heard stock's okay. And then the general smile, and they've got this relationship that's kind of very close and very odd. But the thing we get from that that's really good is we see like, you know, the general reluctantly relaying these orders that he's getting to do things that he knows are terrible ideas and then him just having to give that to his guy and then his guy turning around and thinking he's an asshole for it and then him having to tell his men and his men obviously then thinking he's an asshole for it. That whole kind of like shit trickling downhill thing that mm. happened in the film is really good. I think it's really well portrayed. Like, um, portrayed. Like, uh, I'm not, I'm not relating my life experiences to the Burma campaign in World War II, but again. <laughs> um, I, again, but like I have in the last year or so been in like a, I guess a middle management position, and there is always this tension that I now feel a lot where I like, I I want the people working like with me to like me, which you get the stock guy definitely wants to do right. He's hmm. he's not just trying to. That's the whole thing with letting them call him stock and all this, and the guy telling him you can't do that. There's this feeling that he wants to be the good guy, that he wants to be liked. There's also, I also identified with the position of, you know, there are times, I hope <laughs> my work doesn't watch this, there are times where, like, um, I'll hear an idea from above me and I'll say, I don't think that's necessarily a good idea. I don't think that's the way we should do this thing. And then they're like, but this is the way we're doing this thing. And then I have to then tell everyone that, even though I know they're exactly the circumstance here, like overworked, um, something that's going to add extra stress and extra pressure. And sometimes I have to be the person to come in and say, this is what we've got to do. And I I really thought this film did a great job of portraying this sort of, um, that being in that scenario, even though it's not about 
you know a middle manager in a marketing job it's about you know it's about world war ii it's about the burma campaign but i just felt like it really well handled that stuff i just thought it really well depicted this sort of management structure and the chain of decision making and the chain of responsibility and wanting to be liked versus needing to get something done and having to there's a line in the film where uh, where he says to stock when you lead people you have to hurt people and i thought oh fuck yeah I, I, that is kind of true to some extent um, so yeah, I, I found all that fascinating and I thought I, it's probably one of the reasons I related to the film so much, like that, that I really hooked into it aside from obviously that I think it's very well made and the kind of geography and stakes of it are so good. I, I, I found it really resonated the kind of central relationship as well, um, which I can't always say about fuller movies either. So I, yeah, I, I really liked it. I've got other stuff I want to say about it, but I want to pause, <laughs> leave room for you to say something about all of that if you think. Because I've no, got no, I, I, you know, I was I was sitting on quite a lot of that stuff, and you you jumped in, you jumped in with it. Um, you know, the, definitely that kind of shit rolling downhill thing is 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 really really well realised, um, and kind of is complemented by that kind of the difficulties in communication as well, isn't it? Because there's no way to have those conversations or think feed things backwards and forwards or things kind of where they get frayed there's even more room for mm. kind of uh, dissent i love the um i love the kind of the like you say the forward momentum and the idea of as soon as they get past one hurdle or they, they're moving towards one goal and there's a complication in the middle of it but they get around that and they get to the end of something and then there's something else and then there's mm. something else there's this really good kind of constant um not only is it that the stakes are really clear but there's a really good um ticking clock structure that they have to you know i guess that is more or less the same thing but you've got to get to this point and then you've got to get to, and the film never loses focus um throughout the whole thing which gives it that forward momentum. I yeah. mean, it's a nice, nice 95 minutes as well. You know, you've got, got maybe an extra 10, 15 minutes on your standard fuller. But um, like you say, an abrupt ending, it, it it's a film that felt like it could have gone on a little bit longer. Even. I I don't mind when it ended. I think that it they the bit where they have the battle and they're really drained and then they have to push on even further and you don't get a resolution on them going home, that's a perfect ending for me. The bit that's strange and feels very shoehorned in is the more triumphalist parade stuff that we see. We start to see stock footage of a parade and, and upbeat yeah. music saying, and those are the heroes and we're going to remember them to this day. And it's like, if the film had just ended, because Steel Helmet, if I remember correctly, ends with them just walking on to the next that's thing, right. right? And it felt like this was the, the ending. The story is not get finished or yeah. whatever. Was, yeah. felt, exactly and it felt like that like the guys are really tired they're all they're all like injured fatigued sick um and then they get told they've got to push on and do the next thing and stock kind of stands up and he kind of tells his men who all they've all at this point because when when people get given something like typhus when they've got typhus or um um i can't remember the other things they said but when they've got these like illnesses they'll get like a note pinned on them by the doctor right like the medic goes around and puts this like white bit of paper on them and uh, at the end, everyone's got one of these bits of paper on them. Like everyone who's lying there has got a bit of paper on them. And uh, and so when Stock stands up and he starts hobbling forward and he's like, come on then, men. And they start getting up and they start hobbling along with him. That's like the perfect ending to this movie. It's, I don't need another 20 minutes. I don't need the next battle. I don't need the resolution of them going home. But what I didn't need was the kind of like, uh, and these brave soldiers. Yeah. Great stuff. That's, that's odd to me. Um it, it, it's yeah. got that sort of for all the stuff it gets right it does have a kind of central narrative conundrum to it as well doesn't it like from the outset um with the newsreel like it is it's one of the films that kind of asks you to forget that you know broadly how it resolves um because it is you know it's a well documented campaign within the war we don't necessarily know how it resolves for the particular characters um, but we know that the overall macro state, yeah. we know they're going to be okay. And that's that's why I think something like um, something like Saving Private Ryan does it so well, because you've got this kind of depiction of what that, that whole campaign was told through um, personal story where you, you, you know Matt Damon's going to be okay, but, you know... Um, How's this going to work out for Tom Hanks? How's this going to work out for Vin Diesel? 
you know, there's, <laughs> yeah. there's, there's, there's a, um, there is a tension there. Um, yeah. yeah. And that's the same here with the, with the men, because you do get to know this little group of, of guys. This is, this is another one. And I've, we've mentioned this kind of a lot talking about his films and his war films in particular, where in his earlier stuff, where he's kind of more the auteur, I suppose. Um, he makes kind of a great effort to have very um, kind of diverse, mixed casts of, of a lot of different types of people, which you don't really get so much here. You get the one guy who's like the Filipino soldier, which I guess is full. Of, is a very fuller thing to be like, okay, but they're not all going to be just like square-jawed white guys. But even in this one, you don't quite get that same mix of like types either. Like usually in fuller movies... Even in like what was the submarine one called? Like that was like that as well. I can't remember mm. what it was now. But like uh, <laughs> yeah, high water. yeah, right. But so usually in those movies you you get like I'm an Italian a man, you know, you get all these different like characters. This one doesn't really do that, but it's very um but you still get to know kind of this group of people, don't you? And you get to know like something something that really stuck out to me about this film was its was its humanity at every turn. Like yeah. and, and I think like a really good kind of study in that is have you seen the film Patton? No. So no. it's got Patton came out about eight years later, 1970. There is it, a bit there is a bit in um in the uh, in the biography where um it does mention that he was he was kind of um tapped up to direct Patton as right. well. Right. Interesting. I, I can see why they would go to him based on this because Patton is basically the same structure as Miles Marauders in a lot of ways. Like in terms of their individual plot beats that are very similar um, and they follow kind of a general who's putting his men through hell to, to achieve an objective. Um, in the case of Patton, you go through the North African stuff into Italy and um, you get this stuff in Patton. Patton is all about the kind of megalomania of this guy who he's desperate for his own personal glory that he will, that there's no doubt really in Patton that he's putting his men through hell, not just to win the war or to achieve objectives, but to achieve personal fame. And um, you get this stuff where people will tell him, look, we, we can't push through there. All of our men will, you know, our men are fatigued and they'll, we'll lose loads of people. If we go through that pass, it's too well defended by the Italians or whatever it is. And him being like, no, no, we've got to do it because I need to beat Montgomery to Rome or whatever it is, right? Like I need to beat, no, it's not to Rome, it's to a place in Sicily, but wherever it is, right? There's this feeling that he's doing it for personal glory. We don't know enough about Merrill and Merrill's marauders to know how much of his decision-making was on a similar bent about trying to achieve the objective. But we do get a very similar moment where he's told, are your men in a fit state to go and do this particular thing? And he makes the decision to say, yes, they are and take them through hell, which is something you see a lot in pattern. There are other like parallels to it that really show kind of the, the, the difference in the humanity in Miles Marauders. There's a, there's a bit in pattern, which is a, a true thing that pattern actually did. Um, but there's a bit in pattern where uh, a, 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 there's like a local Italian like farmer and he's got two mules and the mules are being stubborn and they won't get out of the road. Um, and Patton marches up front and says, "Like, why is my column being held up by these by by, by these mules?" Uh, and uh, the farmer, and they're like, "Oh, this farmer just can't move them; they won't move." And um, so Patton just um, takes out his gun and he just shoots both mules, and then the uh, that gets his troops just throw them over the bridge into the river. And uh, this is a thing that Patton really did, and it's a thing that he got like minor flack for. I think maybe he got told off for it because they had to compensate the farmer for his mules and all this. But like the the uh, the there's a there's a kind of exact opposite counter, kind of a mirror to this in this film with much more humanity, where you've got this mule who's going along with the group, and they say, "Look, the mule's holding up the path. We're going to have to just kill it at this point and move on with it." And someone who really cares for the mule makes a case for it and is like, "No, she can pull through. I'm going to carry her load." And then everyone and they're moved by the compassion of this man for the mule, and they bring the mule with them alive. And it's it's like the exact opposite of the bit and pattern. And I think it just is a good microcosm for it because this film does just have those little moments of humanity all the way through. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of which, yeah, I was, I was just, I was just checking while you were speaking, um, and it was I, I'm just checking my pattern um, uh, research here, and it was actually um, Patton's son um, after seeing Meryl's Marauders that approached him about making making a pattern film. Right. Um, 
so that's you know. really interesting. If you watch, if you watch Patton, you will you will see the parallels. Like it's 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 interesting to hear that link because I thought it was maybe a I thought it was a coincidental thing where they were similar on the basis that maybe the stories of World War Two generals are maybe broadly similar in some ways. But um, knowing that uh, what you've just said is is really interesting. It's that this was an influence on Patton. Yeah, I, I'll read it to you here. Um, when George Patton's son came to me later about doing a film about his father, I told him, he told me that he loved Merrill's Marauders, but that in Pentagonese, it had no recruitment flavour. Mm. That's why he wanted me to direct, direct Patton. I know you dislike my father, he said good humouredly, but at least you'll make a hard-hitting movie. So, yeah, um, that was, that was uh, yeah. Wanting him to, to yeah. tell that story, but to amp up the um, recruitment value of it. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. So, and he, he speaks as well, talking about the humanity, he speaks in his bug for it being particularly fond of, of the village scenes um, where where it all goes a little bit um, uh, thin red line. So, I, I wonder what you made of those, um, those moments where they, they kind of, where he, it goes into uh, where they kind of get sidetracked in the in the village. I mean, my first thought was, "Oh no, Fuller's then, done it again." Where like in the middle, here we go, is like a love interest situation, which doesn't quite develop. Uh, well, it doesn't develop at all. It's just like a moment. But no, I, I I enjoyed those scenes. I think that stuff is necessary downtime, and also like the there's a scene of one of the guys, one of the kind of the the officers, I think where um, he's lying there in a daze. Everyone's just in a complete stupor, just exhausted, sick, everything. And this guy's sitting there, and this woman and this boy come over, and they give him some rice. And then he looks at the smiling woman and you know everything, and he just breaks down in tears. And it's just a really nice moment. It's just one of those, like, crying out of just sheer, like, fatigue, like, everything about the situation, seeing somebody being... I suppose smiling in this circumstance is probably quite emotional given everything he's gone through. Like it, there's a lot wrapped up in it and it was really well done. I, think... I thought it was quite, yeah. I mean, I thought, you know, it's not like I haven't seen those sorts of moments of respite in other, but I thought it yeah. was, I thought, especially considering who, who, who we're talking about here, I found it quite understated um, yeah. and, and subtle and brief. And, and like you say, there's no, there's no, um, uh, love story development or anything like that, although it, it mm -hmm. looks like it's going to go that way. Yeah, um, but it, it just kind of, it is literally just a respite, and then you move on, and then all right, we've got to put that in the back of our minds now because we've got to we got to keep walking, and 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 Jeff's just fallen down dead. It just kind of yeah, it, it it's like a little refuel, isn't it? Really, just to 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 keep going. Um, and I was I was surprised that how kind of deftly um deftly subtle it was pulled off um yeah it is it's really well done i i think that the film is full of these moments of lightness and just quiet moments of humanity i think where fuller sometimes uh, errors in my opinion is um he won't allow those moments of subtlety he'll just have a character say the thing you know, he'll just have somebody pipe up and just explicitly say whatever it is. And he's normally quite ham-fisted. Um, I don't know if it was working with this Milton Sperling, that it wasn't entirely his screenplay. But um, it, it, this this really does have a lot of breathing room and a lot of room for nuance and subtlety, I think, in it. I wonder um, if it's that apprehension that he talks about as well. You know, that kind of feeling that... Being for certain. Yeah, and mm. just kind of feeling that like you say, maybe he didn't have complete ownership over this particular story, so he just kind of takes a little um, step away from it. A weird comparison here. Um, but this is um, this is going to get a bit meta, because this is a reference to... Uh, no, maybe it isn't a reference to... I think it was a reference to a uh, review of um, uh, Aaron Sorkin film with... Um, Seth Rogen and uh, Joseph, Joseph Gordon. Maybe Seth Rogen's not in it. Uh, Trial of the Chicago. Trial of Chicago Seven. Seth Rogen is not in it. Joseph Gordon. I think, yeah, yeah, I think he was. He was. Yeah, Seth Rogen was. <laughs> Seth Rogen was cast when Spielberg was going to direct it. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. That, those are. They, that was. There's all sorts of different casts of that film. Over anyway. Um, long production history for a different podcast, but there was a, a line in that where. Um, 
Aaron, uh, one of the reviews, Aaron Sorkin deserves a better uh, director than Aaron Sorkin. Um, <laughs> and I think there might be, there might be an element of this where there is kind of where he's not exactly reined in, but where he is collaborating. It sands some of the um, some of the rougher edges down and leaves the best parts of his work because um, it isn't full and full like full blooded Fuller, but um, the, enough of his concerns that he speaks about and themes and the way that he his films are always humane, even if they are bombastic. Mm. It kind of we said polished early on, and it feels like it's a real kind of polished maybe like a coached even version of, of, of Sam Fuller that, that someone's kind of whether or not it is entirely his own work or, you know, clearly isn't, he's still been picked for this, for his best attributes. And it's his best attributes yeah. that kind of make the film work. Um, I think. Would you I agree? agree? I agree completely. I, yeah, for sure. I think that's a really good way of putting it. I, it's not a direct. It, 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 it's not a director for hire situation because it is still very clearly a Sam Fuller film. Yeah, it's not it, cop out. Yeah, it's not cop out. Yeah, but anyway, sorry, I ranted there a little bit. No, no, it's good, all good. I, I, yeah, I agree with what you said there, and I think um, this is exactly right. Like he, he does have a certain, uh, you know, it's often it's a bit of a truism, but it's I often I often think that thing about like Spielberg and like Jaws, you know, where like, cause you can't see the shark and mm. like being because of technology and about how technological limitations somehow sometimes make better art. They make people make be more creative. And, and you do get a sense here that there are some limitations because it isn't just his screenplay. It isn't his production. Uh, it's a very big budget film. This one, I think it had a budget over a million dollars, which is huge for a fuller film, quite big for a film at this time. Um, and he's on this long shoot, which he usually doesn't do, like on the other side of the world. So that there, there are a lot of, I think, constraints on what he's doing. Not constraints due to a lack of budget, but maybe a constraints due to the pressures of making a film with a bigger budget and with a lot of moving parts and a lot of people to answer to. And which I think is, some of those... a bit of a, there's a bit of a paradox in that as well. I mean, like he talks about that ending in the newsreel um, here, and we, you know, that's kind of the most kind of obvious idea of um uh yeah he talks about to my surprise and anger they studio decided to cut my final scene in the editing room right after Merrill's collapse they spliced in footage of a victory parade of soldiers marching down fifth avenue jack warner is in, in his executives wanted an overt patriotic ending and they decided to end the picture of that propaganda like crap and a pompous narrator bragging about american victory i went toe to toe against and then lost um, so they, they get their jingoistic ending box, but mm. um, the film, considering he wanted Gary Cooper to, to play the lead originally, and then Gary Gary Cooper was ill, um, he does he doesn't deliver. I mean, they they put that ending on themselves, and he doesn't deliver that that boy's own adventure at all, even if it is constrained within that big budget and all those kind of commercial. Um, pressures on top of it it's still it's probably even you know it's probably even it's probably it's probably a, a stronger kind of patriotic tool that it isn't overtly all those things yeah um, it's that that that's a really good point like is that 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 is worth making is that before you chuckle those bells and whistles on it, and I agree the film doesn't necessarily have recruitment value because it yeah. just depicts war as unremitting hell, which is in its favour. Um, but it does have a kind of patriotism, proud of our boys value, on the basis of that they went through this hell and and still somehow had the fortitude to do the thing that they were sent to do, which doesn't need the bells and whistles on the end of it, right? It just doesn't... Uh, it's interesting, like... If Fuller was a, a a more revered director, a more famous director, um, I wonder if there would be a kind of a cut of this film where they just remove things like that. That would be the popular kind of ongoing cut. You know the way that like the version of Brazil that we watch is mm -hmm. the Terry Gilliam version of Brazil these days. It's not the version that was released in cinemas at the time that was cut to shit by the studio. Because 
this isn't a case of like something like Magnificent Ambersons where Orson Welles' version is like lost to time. Presumably you can just edit off that that horrible last like two minutes of this movie. So I, I kind of almost wonder why, why that hasn't been done. Um, but I but guess the monster is yeah. not important or famous or interesting to people enough to, to do that. Yeah, well, it's interesting because eventually we do get that, don't we? we I mean, we, we've been talking about it. It's like it's the big thing on the horizon is the big red one. That's the the kind of the, what everything culminates in. But he gets that with that, you know, um, almost posthumously. Like that eventually he gets mm. his director's cut of that. Um and there seems to be an idea, you know, maybe it's maybe it's a picking the battles thing. Maybe that's the kind of the by that time that the the reconstruction is made that he's got this kind of, although he doesn't have um, mainstream kind of cachet amongst the public, he's definitely got it amongst the new Hollywood directors, yeah. uh, and maybe that all forms part of that as well. I don't know, but. Um, yeah, you know, if you, you're right, it would be it would be interesting to get the opportunity to see uh, a lot of these films because it's happened before. It happened in um, Forty Guns as well, didn't it? It happened in mm. uh, a few of his other films where these endings have been changed or tacked, and it would be interesting to be able to go back and see some of these that were a little bit more yeah. close to the way he 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 comes across with things because it is so. He is so kind of um, considered with, yeah. with with his opinions. I mean, they are. Um, I think the, the common theme that we've had is that he's very he's very black and white. But the time that he takes to make that, and once he's made that decision, that's it. Yeah, um, he he, but he, he takes he, time to get to the point. Yeah, he he's not he, snap judgment. Got- He's got a kind of a nuanced moral kind of worldview and understanding, but he's very forceful. With, yeah. With his, yeah. He's not nuanced in the way he talks about it or portrays it, but it's yeah. surprisingly yeah. nuanced. That was in, um, I'm terrible remembering all the names. That, is it, no, it wasn't called Acton. What's the one that's got like a German? Verboten, Verboten right? Verboten's a classic one for that, right? Where there's a lot of stuff goes on in that film that's got a lot of um, nuance and depth to it. Uh, but it's with the force of a hammer that it's delivered, you know, it's like <laughs> bluntly sort of delivered at all times. Um, but yeah, it, it's uh, going to be really... I'd love to have seen him with a Twitter account. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think it's going to be I think it's gonna be fascinating to see Big Red One. I'm really excited to see it because uh, the, this, this is probably my new favourite fellow film. Like, I really, really like Merle's Marauders. I think it's really good. Uh, so, uh, if, if he can make a film like this with the gloves off and even more of his personal experience and stuff that he's clearly his passion project, uh, with a bigger budget and a quite a good cast and like, you know, I'm really excited to see it. I'm excited to see what that ends up being. And Big Red One was released in what, the, what, the late seventies or when does Big Red One? Oh, 1980. So in a kind of a post Peck and Pal world, I imagine Big Red One's probably a little bit more explicit in its violence and stuff than Fuller's fifties and sixties films as well. I would imagine. I would imagine, I imagine yeah. it's more less bloodless or more bloody would probably be a better way to put it. <laughs> yeah, but, um, yeah. Uh, it's always interesting to see a young Mark Hamill in something where he's not wearing a um, <laughs> where he's wearing an oversized uh, 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 blouse as well. So I'm, I'm quite looking forward <laughs> to that. Um, yeah, does that about wrap it up for this one? Do you think? Yeah, I think so. I'm a yeah, big, big fan of this one. Um, I really recommend Rolls Marauders. It's uh, it is, it is like a lot of his films. Like I said this to my wife Jen yesterday when we when I sat down and put it on, I did say early on, like, I'm really sorry you're having to watch this dad film because it is a dad film, but it's a very good dad film. It's uh, yeah. it, it is it is very it's Sunday afternoon and Dad's popped on. <laughs> but it's, it's, but it's weird, isn't it? We we talked about this as well with Forty Guns a little bit. Like you know, is this this feels Forty Guns feels like it uh, unless it's just kind of ignorance of westerns, which is which is quite likely. You know, it's never been a favorite mm. um, favorite genre of mine. Although the more good westerns that I've seen, the more I've enjoyed them. Yes, yeah, um, this kind of feels like a lost dad film. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? I love that as a category of movie. That should be our new a new strand 
<laughs> Re- reappraising lost dad films. Yeah, like it feels like it should. It does feel should like be a dad film. Be higher in the conversation than than it is. You yeah. know. Um, it should be it should be something you can buy dad on dvd at the counter at asda during a father's day sort of period you know <laughs> yeah um <laughs> but yeah it did very well financially it, it made eight, eight million on a budget of one um and it did kind of um raise the uh his profile a little bit which is strange because because afterwards we we, we kind of go into a uh, a bit of a uh, a back in, back into a bit of an indie period with him, not not massively, yeah. Because but... because even though Shock Corridor and uh, Naked Kiss are very very well regarded films, like I've got the Criterion Blu-rays for both of those, so yeah. they're obviously like really well re- regarded films. They are more sort of back in B movie territory a little bit, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely, and I think part of that is to do with the, the subject matter, um, Naked Kiss especially, um, as you'll see. Um, that that perhaps because of the subject matter, they, they it, it necessitates a kind of a step back. You're not going to get that beautiful. It looks beautiful. Um, uh, Meryl's Marauders as well. Um, the scene where they're, they're sh- but, 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 we haven't didn't talk about it. But the scene where there's a um, a fight in kind of this strange, I don't know how you describe it. This sort of granite structure thing um, that looks really good. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, and one other bit that I didn't mention, I know we we're trying to move on. There's a really funny bit early on in um in one of the battles where they're all throwing grenades and moving forwards. And they mm. all there's one in particular, I just noticed this and it made me laugh, but they kind of all throw their grenades in, in slightly out of synchronization. They look like synchronized swimmers throwing <laughs> grenades. <But> anyway, yeah. <laughs> watch it again, you'll spot it. Uh, but yeah, he goes he goes back off after this, after arguably what what is one of the biggest kind of commercial um sort of prestige successes i guess back into this other mode and he does it um via a brief detour into television that that he doesn't really get on with um and it seems that um there seems to be some sort of i I don't know how he how he approached this but like i say he goes off to television and he describes this yearning to get back to film we're only talking a year um but what Shock Corridor is, he digs out, basically, he digs out a script called Straight Jacket that he'd written in the 50s um, uh, or maybe even the late 40s with the intention of uh, Fritz Lang directing it. Oh, wow. And that's what... Um, um, that Shock Corridor comes out that, of. What, yeah, that's what Shock Corridor comes out of, is, is, a, is a film that he, he envisioned originally for Fritz Lang. That's really fascinating. I'm also going to have a slight more a bit of a heft to bring to the next two because because I've got the Criterion Blu-rays, I will not only have special features, but Criterion Collection films also always have like a little book of essays. So I'm actually going to have some material to uh, to bring to the party, which is going to be nice. Well, uh, so I'm looking forward to that. Most, well, let's let's um, let's let's maybe do come back to this maybe next week because we we have had a little bit of a break for various reasons. Um, yeah, so Shot Corridor next weekend. Yeah, we've got we've got a good patch. We've got Shot Corridor followed by Naked Kiss, and then Shark, and then Shark, uh, which will, mark. and then we get into his late period stuff. Um, yeah, in fact, exciting. Depending on whether or not we can actually find Dead Pigeon on Beethoven Street, fingers crossed. I, is, I didn't know until a television film, which is a television film. So yeah, if we do have to miss it. You know, it's it's. It's, but it's it pretty hip because it says it says on Wikipedia that it's a, a television film for the German crime, crime series Tatort. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like we should. It's a German police procedural television program. I feel like we need to watch uh, the entire season of Tatort to understand Dead Pigeon on Beethoven Street properly. Uh, I, I think, uh, yeah, if we get hold of a copy, I'll, I'll put it on a, 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 a um, film and dubstep night in a repurposed church <laughs> in Kemp Town, Brighton. Uh, and serve nothing but um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, vegan yeah, yeah. Uh, but... okay. So <laughs> but yeah. yeah, I think I think that about does uh, this for this week. We'll talk about Shock Corridor next time. Thanks for joining us. There has been a long break, um, but uh, yeah, we we're, we're back on the horse now, uh, and very much looking forward to the next few of these. So uh, yeah, thanks for watching slash listening. I've been Rob Beams, joined by Craig. See you next time as we embark further along our path.
to obtain a fuller understanding.